Um, so since we use 5.3, we're completely namespaced. <clears throat> so you'll see an example of some of the code. How many of you guys are using namespaces or have played with them yet? <coughs> A couple people. So the namespaces are great because you know it kind of forces you to think a certain way and forces you to name things properly um, and really you know put a lot of thought into the API. Um, those are probably I mean obviously naming is one of the most difficult things to do in programming. It's very hard to find you know the right terms to use for things and also to use those terms consistently. <clears throat> so namespaces are really helps with developing the API and making sure that you know there are no conflicts between libraries. You know, previous to PHP 5.3, you know, trying to mix and match libraries in PHP can be, you know, impossible basically because you never know how things are going to conflict. So namespaces take take care of that. Even though some people may say it's verbose, you know, they don't like the you know the character that they're using. Um, if you get used to using it, you'll like it a lot. So again, here's that same example um, where we use the namespaces so that I don't have to uh, specify the fully qualified class name every single time. Um, at the top of your script, you can say what classes you want to use or what namespaces you want to use. Um, so that makes your application code look just like it did previously. You just have to use those use statements at the top of your scripts. <clears throat> um, another big thing that we did with Doctrine 2 and Symphony 2 as well, um, have you guys heard about the 5.3 interoperability standards? Again, it just goes back to the ability for libraries to mix and play well with each other without conflicting. So the fact that um, we have namespaces in 5.3 gave us a, a fresh opportunity to implement some standards on how classes are named and where those files are located on disk. So the autoloader implementation in 5.3 can be very simple if you follow a few you know, plain rules, and that the rule is basically um, the file name, the, the path to a, a class on the disk should equal the class name. And we basically just replace the namespace separator with the directory separator. So in order to know where a class exists, all we have to do is replace the namespace separator with the class, or with the directory separator, and we automatically have the path to that class. So it's fast. Go ahead. I'm getting a 404 on that. Like, oh, it may have changed. Um, yeah, it changed. Yeah, just yeah. I, I had it. We we switched the group name, and I didn't copy the right one. I can give you the the right link when we get done. Okay. Um, so again, when I mentioned the benefits, you know, now we can mix and match libraries, and we can use one autoloader. Previously, in projects of mine, you know, if I want to use Symphony 1, Doctrine 1, Zen Framework, you know, maybe some other libraries, um, some in-house, you know, proprietary libraries, I may end up with four different autoloaders and, you know, six paths in my include path. That can get really, really slow in a really, really high load environment. You know, I don't want that many things in my include path. I really, I don't want anything in my include path. I want one autoloader that can load all my classes universally, and I want it to be able to do it fast. So following these standards brings some sanity to how things are named and also the performance related to loading those classes. <clears throat> so about the Doctrine 2 code, um, because we use namespaces, we've divided it into multiple packages. Um, this helps for uh, us for maintainability, but also, you know, so the individual pieces are split up nicely. So the first package, we have the common namespace. Um, the root namespace, the vendor namespace, is Doctrine. Um, the common functionality is basically just shared, shared features that are used across the database abstraction layer, across the ORM, um, and all the other libraries. So it contains things like the events, things that are shared, um, the annotations library, it's basically the code, the library that just parses that annotations information out of the doc box. Um, so that's standalone, you can use that in your own projects. Um, it also contains the Lexer parser that uh, is used for parsing the DQL language, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then any other general convenience tools that are used in any of the other packages. So the second package is the database abstraction layer, and it's basically just a wrapper around PDO. 
Um, and we've abstracted the interface of PDO so that you're not limited to just using PDO itself. Um, if you wanted to, you could write an interface or a class that mimics the exact PDO interface, um, but it can communicate with any database you want. So if there's some proprietary database or some database that PDO doesn't support, you can easily write your own driver for it. Um, and this is just, again, a simple abstraction to communicate with your database. Um, just like the annotations package, the database abstraction layer is standalone. So if you don't want to use the ORM and you just basically need connectivity to a relational database, then this is basically going to be what you're looking for. Um, how many of you guys use pair MDB2 or MDB? Any of the old database abstraction layers from PHP 4 days? Well, we do have a world which is from PHP 4 days. Okay. Well, basically, I mean, I'm sure it's very similar to those. I mean, it's, it's the concept, you can't really, you know, improve this concept. It's just an abstraction on a database, and it gives you, you know, convenience for running queries. Um, the, the ours gives you a little bit more abstraction than pair MDB2 or ZenDB. Um, but in addition to executing queries, you can also manage and issue DDL statements. So you can actually issue queries to get data, but you can also work and manage your schema from within the database abstraction layer. So here's an example. Um, you know, I just create a basic connection. This is an example. I create a MySQL connection, and we have a connection object there now, and it's just basically like the PDO API. It's very similar, and it just wraps around it. <clears throat> So in addition, like I said, uh, with uh, executing queries, you have the ability to manage DDL statements. And this is done through what's called the schema manager. So now you have methods on this schema manager to um, intuitively change your schema through just some, a nice API. You have create table, drop table, create foreign key. <clears throat> and then you also have methods for learning about the existing schema. So we, a good example of what we use these methods for is when we, want, when we want to import an existing database into Doctrine 2, we can reverse engineer your database by listing the tables, listing the columns that are in each table, listing the foreign keys, and we can actually reverse engineer a potential mapping for an existing legacy database. So here's another example where we drop and create a table. So this is also, this is very um, convenient, you know, for running migrations, database migrations. Um, in a production environment, you know, when you change something in your application, you change your schema, you know, typically, I mean, I've seen lots of different ways for managing um, changes to your database. Some people will, you know, run the query and save it in a text file and literally just have a list of changes. Um, some people will write scripts, you know, that they deploy. Um, but this will basically give you a programmatic way to actually write, you know, nice scripts that you can be that can be deployed to upgrade your database. Um, and there's actually another layer built on top of this that I won't have time to talk about today. Um, it's the doctrine migrations, but it's basically just a layer on top of this that allows you to version, literally version the schema of your database, similar to how you were to, you know, version files in Git. <clears throat> So here's another example where we create a foreign key with the schema manager. So the last package is the Doctrine ORM, of course. This is the, the killer feature of Doctrine. Um, it's built on top of the database abstraction layer. And like I mentioned, it provides the transparent domain object persistence to relational databases. So I mentioned also briefly, um, because of everything being transparent, you can persist to other databases. Uh, I won't talk too much about this, but we also have another project for persisting to MongoDB. And it's the same architecture, same interfaces as the ORM. It allows you to persist those exact same objects except to another data store. <clears throat> um, so basically, you know, previously the Doctrine project was solely an ORM. And then when Doctrine 2 came along, we split out the packages into a separate database abstraction layer, and we split it into the ORM, and then we have the common package. And now since we've introduced this MongoDB persistence layer, um, the umbrella of the project is kind of widened into, um, you know, basically creating specialized persistence, database persistence tools, and some related functionality. 
So I'm going to go over the architecture a bit. I already mentioned a little bit, we have the entity manager. Um, the entity manager for the ORM is basically the central object that you use to manage the persistence of objects. So you have the entity manager and the document manager for MongoDB. <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier the states of an object. So internally, when you have an entity manager and a document manager, when I pass an object to it, Internally, Doctrine is going to manage the state of this object, and at any given time, it knows what the state of it is. It knows the old data of the object so that it can use that old data to compare it to the new data to compute those change sets. So basically, when you create a new entity or a new document with the new operator, the state is going to be new. Um, as soon as I persist an object or fetch an object from Doctrine, it's going to be managed. Um, if you have an object that it has an ID and it exists in the database, but Doctrine is not managing it yet, then it would be detached. Um, and a removed object is basically inside of Doctrine, um, it's scheduled for deletion. So when I pass an object to the remove method on the entity manager, internally it sets the state to remove, and then when I call flush, it's going to loop through all the managed, document, or managed entities, and it's going to see that this one has been removed, and it'll result in a delete SQL statement. So here's where we get into actual, you know, this is creating an entity manager service. <clears throat> so the same thing for the document manager. It's basically we just have two different instances that you can use to transparently persist these objects. So like before, I showed the example where we transparently persist this user. The same with the, for updating and removing. So that will basically set the state to remove, and when you call flush, it'll calculate the changes and remove that user record from the database. And remember I said the detach state. So when I've detached this user object, it's still there, the object is still in memory, but because I've detached it from Doctrine, it doesn't manage it anymore, and even though I've changed the username, the flush doesn't result in anything because Doctrine is no longer managing that object. So the Doctrine query language, I mentioned it a little bit before. Um, are any of you guys familiar or heard of DQL or maybe HQL from Hibernate? So, so basically it's just a, it's, it's very similar to SQL. Um, it's a proprietary object query language um, and it's heavily based off of SQL. Um, but instead of working with tables and columns, you're working with objects and fields. Um, so basically in Doctrine 1, um, we kind of had a, not really a real parser as far as, you know, a programming language would have. You know, when you make a mistake in the programming language, you get a real parser error and it tells you exactly what's wrong with that string, where, you know, what column and what line. So with Doctrine 2, we actually re-implemented the language in a real um, Lexer parser. So it's a real language that has real, a real BNF and, and grammar rules that can be broken. Um, so basically, the way it works is when we parse the DQL string, it builds what's called an AST, and an AST is an abstract syntax tree. And in any programming language, um, or any language in general, um, when you parse a string, it constructs some kind of object hierarchy in memory, and then that object hierarchy is used to generate other things. In our case, we use the AST to then generate the SQL. So we parse the DQL query, it gets uh, parsed into a set of PHP objects, and then we can use those PHP objects to generate the full portable SQL to whatever relational database we're using. So the DQL looks the same no matter what relational database I use. And based on your connection information, it's going to generate the SQL that's required for that database. So not all databases have limit and offset, for example. And we need, to, we need to make that portable. So basically, um, in DQL, DQL, you have a limit and offset, and that's parsed and made portable to the different types of relational databases. 